Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, our lecture will be a continuation of the previous one that we were talking about in terms of motivation. If you recall, we had seen two models. One was the base model which explained the process of motivation and the link between needs and goals. And further then we did a very strong model that we said has become a major uh, input into marketing, and that was the Maslow's need hierarchy. Now, before we enter today's lecture, let's recapitulate a little bit of the discussion that we had previously so that we are on the same ground. Last time we had discussed motivation as a drive to take some action. And it was suggested that according to the model, when there is a gap between ideal situation that a person wants to be and the current situation in which the person finds himself to be, this gap creates tension within the person. And what he tries to do is that he tries to reduce this tension by going into action. And that action is what we said is de developed through the process of need. Now, need leads to desire, and then desire leads to the goal, which is the end of the process of need satisfaction. So we said need and goals are linked together, and they have a direct relationship with the concept of motivation. Now, in the model, as you see, we had also suggested that there are two points of influence which influence the behavior related to motivation. And in that, we had said something like previous learning and cognitive processes, which means the learning process that we have, which influences the way we are motivated and the way we satisfy our needs. However, in this class, I will put specifically three uh, influences that do have an impact on the way we behave if there is a motivation. And these three influences are, number one, the ability of the person to be able to behave in a particular manner and achieve a goal. Second is the opportunity that the person has. And finally is the risk that the person finds inherent in the way the decisions to satisfy a need can lead to. Further, we were also going to uh, discuss the assignment that I gave you and that we will do at the final end processes of this. Further, we will be discussing, uh, since we will be discussing these uh, three models, the three factors which will influence, that will take us to the conclusion of that. But in this, we will also try and handle the assignment that I gave to see how marketers are confronted with the problem of actually identifying the need. And that would be a good example of what happens in the marketing realm when we try and understand the need. Now, in this session also, I had discussed a little bit about Maslow's need hierarchy and the model that was there. We will further go into the way this model is used for marketing purposes, and we will relate a few other concepts of uh, needs and see how they can be fitted into this overall concept so we get a clearer picture of how the needs models are applied and how we can use it for the purposes of marketing. Now, having said this, let's look at the needs hierarchy again, and we will see that there are five levels that have been given. Theoretically, this model seems to be that it is totally exclusive. All steps are mutually exclusive from one another. But what Maslow, Dr. Abraham Maslow was suggesting that these needs can never be totally satisfied. So what happens is that a person may be still operating at the lower level need, having satisfied a certain level of it, and he's already moving into the new level need. So there is always an overlap. But what he was saying was, that there will be one need which will predominate the person. That is what we need to understand. What it basically suggests is that needs are operating, lower needs are more dominant, and as we proceed 
to satisfy that lower level need, the new need gets activated. However, till such time that the lower need is still operative, there will be a, a crossover between the needs of the person and his behavior will be then determined by two or three things at the same time. And that is what the problem with this model is. It is very difficult to establish very categorically which need is actually being satisfied and which need is being activated. And I told you that even though the logic is very simple, that the lower level needs must be satisfied before the higher level needs become activated, but then we never know, as we had already discussed, that these needs are never fully satisfied. So the question is, if the need is not fully satisfied, which need should we target onto? And that is where the quality of a marketing manager comes into position because he tries to explain uh, and determine which need will be predominant. And if you watch, most of the marketers maybe are selling similar products, but when they approach the target, they tend to use different kind of promotional tools. And these tools are based on their own assessment about the consumer and what they believe is more predominant at that point of time in the consumer's mind. What need is more significant? Further, that I had already discussed was a major component, and that was that needs tend to go from a lower level to a higher level, and they have to pass through this whole process. But I also told you that according to practical life, very few examples exist where people tend to move straight from the lower level needs to the highest level needs and ignore the needs in between. And I mentioned uh, a major historical figure like Buddha who had actually moved directly into self-actualization and ignored the safety and the social needs altogether. Keeping these in mind, we now want to look at briefly, again, very briefly, to see what are the marketing implications of these needs. And we need to see where promotions are being made or how these needs are being used by the marketers in promoting their products. Now, let's take the first need. We will see insurance, for example. Uh, we, we see insurance, where does it fit in? Oh, it fits in with safety needs. Why? Because it tries to give us security in our life. So we need to have some kind of security. And we, and normally uh, the insurance people tend to promote the safety need as the critical point. On the other side, we also see health foods. People promote health food. It's the thing which is basically biogenic, which is what we say the physiological need of eating, and we are trying to promote healthy life. That means you are trying to promote good eating. Uh, if you look at health services, they also target into the same frame. Now, there are some cars or some automobile uh, uh, manufacturers and marketers who tend to use this single concept of safety in their advertising. For example, Volvo suggests that it is the most safe car. Why they believe it is being targeted? It is targeted because there is a very strong uh, desire among people when they are driving to be having a safe drive. On the other side, we see uh, BMW as the ultimate driving machine. Now they suggest that it is more egoistic. You are into the ultimate uh, driving machine, which is what we can see in major promotions. So safety, as well as your basic uh, physiological needs are handled this way. And if you look at most of the toothpaste ads or the deodorant ads, and if you recall the ad where uh, the person hits a six in a cricket field and he raises his hands with the bat and the field, fielders all around him drop and faint. That is a typical uh, depiction of the social need operating where uh, bad breath from the mouth or from the uh, skin or for the, from the other purposes normally tend to affect social behavior. So 
that is basically targeted into that kind of a, a, a need frame. Now, again, if you recall that there was something like ego, which I've already mentioned in terms of the BMW, but it is suggested that all high technology products, which are more uh, conspicuous to other people, we tend to use our ego systems. They normally promote the ego, the self-esteem, the self as the major component of that need. Uh, finally, we find self-actualization. It is suggested that even though there is a very little gap between self-actualization and ego, but self-actualization is more internally motivated and people tend to do what they really want to do. And as Dr. Maslow, Abraham Maslow suggested that ek admi ko wo banna chahiye jo wo chahta hai ban jaye ya jo uski potential hai. In other words, he says what a man should be is what a man can be. So what you can be, you must achieve. And that is where people normally tend to go. And according to research, uh, people tend to go for postgraduate uh, studies because they have a self-actualization drive behind them. Uh, again, Maslow did try and suggest that it is more artistic, uh, but we don't see that too many, but a writer, a painter, and so on and so forth, they tend to uh, target this, this particular need. And many ads are, are used for the purposes of trying to promote the self uh, actualization or self-achievement uh, to show people that they've been able to reach their own uh, potentials. Uh, having now discussed this and also discussed the various uh, issues that we find in uh, self, this uh, motivating framework, we now need to look at briefly, we now to look at the influences that I had suggested to you uh, when the motivation is operating. Now, I had suggested three uh, motivating factors uh, that can have a, a problem. In this form, we had suggested that there are so many other needs that have been researched. Uh, for example, there is a need for power. We have a need for affiliation. Now, again, the logic, what is being suggested here is that all these needs which have been researched and various uh, researchers have tried to figure out the other needs that are motivating people, they can still be directly related to the Maslow's need hierarchy. For example, the concept of power. Now, the concept of power suggests a desire of an individual to control his environment. And if you look at it, uh, from the way a person would behave, driven by the need of power, it relates to the need of uh, Maslow's ego. Uh, ego is, we said, the thing which the person wants to suggest, he is better than everybody else is, he is in control of his situation. So power need can directly be linked with the need of ego or self-esteem in terms of Maslow. Uh, the second need that has been also researched and suggested is affiliation. Now, again, affiliation is when you want to associate with people. From there, if we take it directly into Maslow's need hierarchy, we find that it relates directly with the social need that uh, Maslow has suggested. The final one that we were discussing as a particular need that has been suggested in research is the need of achievement. Now, need of achievement, the people who possess this need are normally more into their self and it relates directly to the need of, again, self-actualization as well as uh, ego of Maslow's need hierarchy. People who have this need of self-achievement have uh, a concern about their personal uh, standards and personal life. And they tend to bring forth uh, efforts which try to satisfy this particular need. And therefore, marketers tend to use this aspect substantially in their promotional campaigns. And there will be a number of ads that can be seen. And I will show you a few ads on the screen to suggest that needs of achievement can be played 
at that high level. Now, it is also very closely related to, like I said, the ego need, whereas self-actualization is a strong part. It also has a link with the ego need. Now, let's go back to the marketing area and look at the implications that marketer use these needs for. Basically, these needs are used for developing promotional uh, messages. And not only promotional messages is one of the major factors that is used that it is used for. We also use these for segmentation and you must record and remember this point that I'm suggesting where what, what we have been discussing till today that every person is different from one another overall. But we need to understand that there will be some significant factors or uh, some significant characteristics which are common. And these common uh, characteristics combine to form a proper segment. And it is in this situation also, we will find that people are driven by different kinds of need. And if you group many people together, you will get a particular uh, a segment which shows the same kind of need that is operating. And in this particular case, we have suggested that needs can be targeted in towards the physiological needs. Uh, we find safety and security needs. We find uh, social and affiliation and togetherness need. Then we have the ego need or the uh, self-esteem need where people want to be or show that they are better and they have a particular class in their systems. And finally, we have the self-actualization need, which goes beyond the individual self. And then we are reaching a particular level where it is uh, for the satisfaction of the person's inner capability and inner potential. So we find that self-actualization can have two frames. One is internally driven, particularly you are internally motivated for doing all kinds of things. Having come to this point, I think at this point, we like to look at the assignment that I gave you. And if you recall, in the assignment, we had uh, built a scenario where four people in the same company had applied for a loan. Now, the application for writing the loan is what we suggested is their behavior. Now, that was the behavior. And the outcome that or the goal that was being uh, desired by these people was basically to get money, 50,000 rupees. But there must be a motivation that was driving each one of them. And just to recapitulate the four people, uh, we had said that the first person wanted the loan because he was interested in paying fee for his son who was going to go to a good school. The second person who was asking for money was interested in buying new clothes because he had joined the company and he wanted to improve his wardrobe. The third person who was interested was going to throw a party for his sister's wedding. So we wanted to see what kind of motivation was driving him there. Finally, we had suggested that there is a person who wants to go on a safari uh, to Africa and therefore he had asked for loan. Now, the first person, let's look at him. He ask for money or he wanted to borrow the money because he wants to pay for his son's education in a good school. Now, what do you think your answer would be? My guess is people might tend to say that it was the social need what was driving him. Well, it is possible that it could be social need. However, social need is only operative if he wants his son to go to that school where the children of his colleagues are also going. Now, that creates a social frame where he wants to be part of the group whose children are going to that particular school. Now, but we cannot just leave it at that. Suppose this person is worried about his future. Suppose he's worried about his old age. Now, he wants his son maybe to go to that school because he believes that as the son grows up and when he goes, uh, gets older, the son will be able to support him. Now, if that picture comes into position, well, we have a problem because now he is operating not on the social need, but he is operating on the safety and security need. Let's look at another situation. 
suppose the person has another motive behind it and that is he wants to impress all his colleagues all his friends that my son is going to the top level school now this gives a new twist to the whole thing so at this point of time he is being motivated not by safety not by social factors but by ego self esteem need that my son is in a better school now let's look at the next person that we said wanted to borrow money he had actually written the letter saying that he wants to buy clothes for coming to the office now once again look at it from this point the logical uh, feeling would be that he wants to be socially accepted in the company so he wants to buy similar clothes which are related to the uh, the social norm of the firm or organization that he has joined but let's hold it at this point of time is it possible that he wants to buy clothes which he believes would be better than what the other friends or his colleagues will wear if that happens obviously the need that is motivating him is not social but it is more egoistic however we could also look at it from the other point that he might be scared that if he does not wear the proper clothes he would be rejected by people and may also be dismissed from the company if that starts the process starts in his mind then he may be operating at the safety level need uh, or security level need now again what i am emphasizing here is that the logic of totally banking on this concept of need may be a little uh, uh, a dicey in the sense that we may not be doing the right thing however it is a very important framework and it has been used very extensively and when we come to the point of motivational research we will understand a little bit more of what needs to be done in terms of a country like pakistan because these needs have been developed or have been uh, framed for culturally oriented highly developed society so we may need to look at it from a little bit of different angle and may we may need to carry out further research in trying to establish a category of needs within uh, a contextual setting like pakistan now we have done the two let's look at the third person who actually wants to throw a party on his sister's wedding again logic would immediately tell us that he wants to have a get together so that means he is operating at the uh, uh, social need frame but like i've done before is it possible that he wants to impress his friends he wants to impress his family members by the kind of party he is throwing so at that point ego is involved or if we were to look at it from a very different angle and a very difficult angle which may reflect a part of our culture but which is true and that is is it possible that he is scared that if he does not throw a good party his sister may suffer and because of the sister's suffering he may suffer in return because possible the in-laws may uh, reject whatever he has done and therefore a problem is operating in his mind which may be totally safety and security oriented where he is scared that by his not doing a good job his sister would suffer and maybe uh, uh, there will be problems coming through which he will have to face so again we need to understand that it's very difficult to be very very sure but we need to be able to learn the method of trying to discern uh, accurately what a group of people are actually motivated by in terms of need uh, let's take the final example and then we should proceed in terms of motivational research and how can we do that research the example was of a person who wants to go to africa for a safari now again the things which are operating seemingly he is doing it for himself so if he is doing it for himself he wants to go alone he wants to uh, uh, satisfy his own potential then logically he is operating at the self actualization need however if he was going for this safari because some of his friends are going and therefore he wants to join that group logically then he is operating in the social need uh, the issue for marketers is this to be able to understand and then try and apply these concepts in their promotional campaigns or even use them for the purposes of 
segmentation, properly segmenting the market so that they can actually produce a proposition for the market which will be targeted at uh, uh, the right customers and the customers will find value in it. Uh, having said all this, now let's look at the motivational research and where did it come from? The basic logic of motivational research, uh, particularly psychoanalytical research, starts from Sigmund Freud. He is a German psychologist who actually started talking about people not being able to understand their own personal needs or their own personal motivations. And he was trying to uh, suggest that why does a person behave in a particular manner? And try and remember that at that point of time, the frame was more socially oriented. That means people operating in a social sector or a social framework, people were mentally disturbed. And in this behaviors, uh, mentally disturbed behavior or odd behaviors, people were trying to understand why does a person behave in a particular manner. And at that point, Sigmund Freud had an uh, advantage. He was in the forefront. So his uh, thinking processes were that people tend to not even know why they behave in a particular manner because there are certain factors which influence them. Now, as this was true, people adopted it. It has been widely used. But there has been a little bit of a problem when this uh, research was totally incorporated into the marketing realm. Now, in marketing, the problem is, like I've already discussed with you the points that I've made, that the research that started was basically clinical. That means as in a kind of a hospital setting where people tended to look at people who were suffering mentally or was disturbed. And therefore, it is very difficult uh, to suggest that whatever was done and researched at that point of time could immediately be brought into position in terms of marketing. So we may, must need to, we may need to uh, adapt all these things specifically for a particular context. And like I said, this research has been carried out mostly in the developed countries. Similar research has not been done in Pakistan. We may need to carry out further research before we can fully incorporate this in our own system. Now, uh, we also should understand that over a period of time, consumer behaviorists have tried to look at an ordinary uh, or a general uh, frame of uh, what we call consumer. Whereas clinical uh, uh, psychology or the psychoanalytical techniques which were being used were targeted at individual behaviors. One single person, and we were trying to understand why did that person behave. Whereas in marketing, we are trying to understand a group of people who are behaving within a segment. So that is where the issues come in. Now, logically, this, uh, uh, this kind of research is more qualitative. If you understand the discussion that we had in terms of the research, we need to understand that this is qualitative because there is no empirical method to confirm that this is exactly what is happening. And because it is qualitative, it is very difficult to generalize it over a people or a group. It's very difficult to carry out the findings and generalize it over uh, everybody. So again, there was an issue in that there is no empirical. Empirical means practically uh, quantifiable method to determine whether this need exists or not, whether this need has been completely satisfied or not, and so on and so forth. So we must recognize these four or five issues before we look at and go into uh, and take this as a choice to start our uh, promoting, promotional campaigns or use it for our marketing purposes. Now, let's look at what are the influences on this motivational behavior. We had, in the beginning, I had suggested that we will try and revisit the initial model that I showed you, where what they call the tension is created because there is recognition of a need from the current position going to the ideal position that is desired. So you have tension, desire is created. Then we go into behavior, which is goal-oriented, and we try and satisfy it. And we showed two arrows, one from the top, which said experience, previous experience, 
and then cognitive processes, which was from the one that is arrowed from below to the um, behavior. Now I'm going to replace these two because that's very broad and become more specific in this frame. And we'll put three influences into position. I will discuss the two very generally because it is very simple to understand. And then we will look at the third one, which is a little bit more in detail, and that is called risk. So the three points that normally are brought into research and have suggested in theory, one is the ability of the consumer to behave in a particular manner. Obviously, that will impact the, uh, the what do you call, the whatever behavior or action that he wants to take. And the ability, if we go back and recall the walls framework that I had suggested in which in the top corner we had people who were very resourceful, had all kinds of resources, and then we had, and they were known as innovators, and at the bottom we found that people who have less or very limited resources called the strivers. Now, if we only look at these two, the concept of ability is more clear. For example, a person may be motivated to buy something of a very high quality or a very high image or whatever to satisfy a particular need, but because he does not have the ability to purchase that, he may go for a sec secondary kind of product which reflects or is a, or what you call a copy of the higher level product. And we find that marketers have been able to use this kind of concept very extensively. For example, a company like Gap, has three particular brands that they uh, sell in the market. One is known as what we call Banana Republic. Now, Banana Republic is their higher-end product, whereas Gap is the middle-range product. And then they have Old Navy, which is the lower-end product. So it's the same company trying to sell similar products, but each product category is targeted at a different kind of uh, group. And provides uh, the ability for the person to be able to purchase. Number two, which is important, is that the ability also is related to the way the consumer will interpret information. Now, the consumer has to interpret whatever the promotional message is being given by the marketer. If the interpretation is not as accurate as it should be, what will happen is perceptions will change, and because perception will change, behavior pattern will change. So uh, issue that is important in terms of ability is not only in terms of ability of purchase, but also the ability of the consumer to be able to interpret the information that is being provided to him or interpret the cues, uh, which is basically an indicator of a particular need. If you can do it, yes, uh, ability is into position. The second category out of these influences is the opportunity. Uh, again, opportunity is simple to understand. If the person does not have the opportunity to buy a particular product, it becomes very difficult even if he's very much motivated to buy it. And these opportunities can be a uh, barrier or can be, there can be barriers between the motivation and the action that he needs to take based on maybe governmental factors, maybe government does not allow luxury goods to be imported in a country. And if that happens, the person who may have the motivation may also have the money or the ability to purchase that may not have the opportunity to do it. Uh, now, having discussed these two, let's get on to the way which is very important, and that is risk factors which affect uh, consumer behavior and also has a very strong impact on the motivation and influences the motivational frames very strongly. For this purpose, on the screen that you see, we have listed down close to about six risk factors. Now, the first risk factor is the functional risk. The second one is the physical risk. The third is financial risk. The fourth is social risk. Fifth, the psychological and sixth, the time risk. So one by one, we will discuss these. Now, the functional risk. Functional risk is basically related to the product's use. Now, 
I may have the reason to buy a product, but if I am worried that whether after purchase the product will even perform at that level creates my functional risk. For example, uh, cell phones. Sometimes people tend to look at the battery life and that becomes a very major area because other motivations, the quality and stuff like that is there, but the risk of uh, having the battery only last for one hour or this uh, psychological frame start operating and a risk of funct functional failure might be the one that is uh, critical. The second one is the physical risk. Now, physical risk is basically the risk to myself or to people around me. And we can see this risk factor operating. For example, there was, if you recall, uh, sometime back there was a lot of news uh, in the news media that cell phones may cause uh, some problems in the ear or in the brain. Tumors can happen because of the kind of uh, signals that are transmitted and may have an impact. Now, maybe there was no truth behind it, but uh, a risk had started working, and that is the risk what we call as physical risk. And it was also suggested, and for example, we also see this in the smoking frame. Uh, people are concerned now that even if you do not smoke, but if you are in presence of people who are smoking, you can have an impact. Your physical uh, health can be impacted. So that is one other frame of risk that is uh, uh, applicable here. And we can see that most of the advertisements, particularly the government, has now uh, uh, has a regulation that each cigarette ad must have a warning which says that cigarettes can harm or damage health. The third risk is basically financial, which basically means that if I even go and buy a product, uh, pay for it, is it possible that I have wasted my money because maybe after three or four months or maybe five months, a new model is going to be launched and my worry starts immediately on that frame, even though I want to buy it and I have the motivation to buy it, but I will not buy because a feeling is there that after six months, a new brand will be launched in the market and this will be a financial loss to me. Uh, to protect against this, if you watch uh, what, the, what the marketers tend to do is that before they were to launch a new brand, they normally reduce the price of the old brand. Uh, we can see this a number of times in the electronic good industry, uh, even the mobile phone systems, the older models are at a lower price and the new models are at a higher price. Maybe they tend to give similar kind of facilities, but because the model is old, so they have discounted the price to a level where the consumer can, uh, what you call, exchange the uh, new or old model for the lesser price frame. So the third category that we discussed is financial. Now the fourth one is more socially oriented. Socially oriented is uh, if I buy something, uh, the fear is would people laugh at me because I bought this thing or would people or would I be embarrassed if I took this product or maybe have a haircut which people may not appreciate so I become socially scared in using a particular service or a particular uh, product for the reason that I will not be accepted by the group in which I belong. So social risks are also an important framework which has a tendency to influence. I might like to go somewhere. I might like to get a particular haircut. I may have all the motivations, but the risk moves in that people who I am friendly with or the group that I belong to might make fun of me. So social uh, problems come into position. Fifth one is psychological. Now, psychological is basically uh, internal fears that I have related either to the product or the service, and that could basically come from the point that it may fail altogether. The product may not function in the way it should, and so on and so forth. So psychological is a little different, and it could relate to how much time I've wasted. Uh, maybe if it fails, even though there is a guarantee, I will have to run after the marketers or the or the company to get a replacement, and so and so forth. These are basically psychological frames that come into position. 
Uh, another example of this psychological uh, uh, issue is, let's say I want to throw a party uh, for my social friends and I have a choice. Now, I want to throw a party and I want to do it at my home, but I may be embarrassed that if I did it at my home, my people or the friends around me may not like that and they might prefer going to a hotel or similarly. So we have this issue of psychological fears which or risk uh, implications which have an influence on the behavior, final behaviors that we have. Uh, in the final case, then we have time risk. Now, time risk basically is related to the amount of time I have invested in trying to locate a product. The problem is that if I go through all the time frames, uh, you know, searching the product, going to the shop, locating the retail outlets, and the fear is that would I be able to get the exact product that I want, or is the product going to give me the exact service that I required out of it? Now, this is related to the time that you invest. Uh, risk, therefore, if you add all of them up, becomes a substantial influence on the motivation. Uh, now, let us clearly remember that in terms of product, the risk is, may not be as significant as it is related to the risk in services for a simple reason that products can at least be returned, product can at least be repurchased, but services, once it is being conducted, it's been consumed. And once it's consumed, there is no way that you can go, go backward on it and try to locate it. And this discussion, most probably we have already done in basic marketing courses when we try and distinguish the two. And the distinguishing factors are that services being intangible, consumed repeatedly at the time of its production, are very different than the services that we tend to have, or oh, sorry, the products that we have, which are tangible, we can see it, at least we can reduce the risk in many forms that we can handle. Uh, after this, let me go to the context of what marketers can do if we understand uh, the way consumers try and reduce their own risk. Now, if we understood this, then the marketer can support, help, advise, or carry out some marketing tactics or strategies to facilitate the consumers in reducing their risk. Obviously, if you reduce the risk, the value to the customer for that product or for that company's brand will go up. Now, the first method by which consumers try and reduce the risk is to seek information. And now they look at all kinds of information. They go for word of mouth. They try and look at opinion leaders. They try and approach uh, information on the media, on the internet. They try and compare a number of alternatives before they finally make a choice. And all this is done to be able to reduce the uh, riskiness uh, within their purchase decision or their or whatever the motivation they have or whatever they are trying to fulfill at that point of time. Now, there is consequences for marketers in this frame. Now, if we know that the person's approach to risk reduction is by seeking information, how can I facilitate as a marketer to help this reduction going on? What would I do is I'll try and provide maximum information. I'll try and approach opinion leaders who have an influence on number of buyers because that is what we will learn in the future. As we go along, we will see opinion leaders' uh, behavior or opinion leaders' impact on consumer purchase behaviors. We will come to that. Now, therefore, like I was saying, that marketers must try and understand how consumers try and reduce their uh, risk so that they can facilitate those frameworks. Now, we have been discussing the requirement of information that customers try and bring into position and they seek information to try and reduce the risk. The second area that we are concerned with is that consumers normally become brand loyal. Now, why is this brand loyalty such an important framework that we have? We should understand, and if you recall, the area that we were discussing in the VALS, V-A-L-S framework, uh, the VALS framework as we call it, uh, for segmentation purposes, we saw that innovators, are risk takers. Innovators have high resource levels. They can buy anything. 
they can do anything and obviously they tend to purchase products because they want to experiment and they are have enough resources to continue to do that obvious logic suggests that these are the people who will not be uh, brand loyal which means that they will keep switching brands for the purposes of uh, because they have the resources that they can experiment around therefore the brand the people who are risk averse the people who avoid risk are the people who are normally more brand loyal and if that is so then logically a marketer must try and promote his brand so much that the people who consume that brand become brand loyal and if he becomes brand loyal then the other fears that surround him are going to be reduced uh, the third frame is that people tend to buy in relation to the brand image now if you recall we talked about previous experience now if there is no experience if there is no experience because brand loyalty relates to experience where if there is no experience what does the uh, consumer do to reduce his risk of choice he tries to find a product which has got high brand image now if the brand is high has high image among people around uh, the environment in which the person lives he is more attuned to or is more amenable to go and purchase that same brand now that is why we try and create brand images in the market so that people who have never experienced the brand may be more influenced or may have less risk in trying to purchase that similarly we also see that consumers tend to reduce their risk by going to reputable retail outlets the logic is that they assume that if the retail outlet which has got a high reputation then those people must have selected the right products to display in their shop now if that happens what a consumer will tend to do is that he will accept the uh, choice of the retailer because he trusts that retailer because the retailer's image is high therefore i'll try and go and buy a product from that and it will not really be important for me to try and see what kind of product it is or what kind of brand it is because i am trusting the retailer to have merchandised the correct product fifth is that where a consumer will try and buy a product which is really expensive the logic again comes in this position that a product which is expensive must have high quality even though we have never experienced it uh, in terms of the brand then because we are scared of failure or scared of psychological frameworks or so many other reasons we tend to go for the costliest product within the brand category to eliminate certain amount of risk finally uh, the consumers tend to seek reassurance once they have bought the product the the method of reducing their risk having bought is to find reassurance from either the seller uh, or the people around them who would then praise their choice and you know give them total acceptance of the product in terms of social factors in terms of the product's uh, ability to provide service and if you watch if you bought something expensive or you bought some electronic good you will always find a card inside the product uh, package which says that you are welcome you have done a good job you have done a good you made a good choice of this product and so on and so forth further the marketers tend to send a letter if they have got an address they will try and send a letter appreciating the person having bought this product and having bought this product they tend to praise the person's ability to have made the right choice given all these factors we have been able to determine what are the motivating factors that influence uh, uh, the consumer's decision further we have also looked at certain factors which uh, influence the frames including the ability the opportunity and the risk and we have also tried to understand how consumers tend to reduce these risk factors and how marketers can support the process of risk reduction now uh, more or less the topic of motivation uh, which had started from segmentation 
is now complete. We have been able to understand motives, behaviors, uh, needs, and goals as they relate to each other. We have then tried to look at the frameworks which will uh, related to Maslow's need hierarchy, the issues within trying to follow blindly into the needs framework. We have also tried to understand that there are reasons to carry out for the research and the type of research which may be more practicable in terms of generalizability because if there is research which has been undertaken and we can generalize it over a number of people, just uh, we say that we have more people us ek frame ke andar, uh, can I, we have brought it into position. These points uh, will help us in trying to use uh, the concept of motivation and needs in a, in a better manner. In the next class, what I will tend to do is to launch into the concept of personality because it is suggested that uh, people perceive their own personalities in different frameworks and there is a direct link between the individual's personality and the brand personality. Now, this topic, we will pick it up in the next class, and then we will proceed from there. Thank you very much.